Um, we still have participants joining in, but we will start off. Interpretation is available in Spanish. We have the wonderful Tanya and Elena with us as interpreters. You can click on the globe icon at the bottom of your screen to access interpretation. In case you have any challenges, please message in chat and we'll fix it. Giving everyone a second to switch if they like. Lovely. I'm so excited, but I'm also a little bit sad today. Um, today is the last webinar in the series, The Power of Feminist Narratives, From Fragmentation to Solidarity. My name is Vandita, and I've been very honored to have been the moderator of the series, which was put together by the fabulous Heinrich Bohl Foundation team. Over the course of the five webinars, including today, we have had a powerful global community show up to be a part of these conversations, truly highlighting the power and need for holding space for building these multiple feminist narratives. So thank you for being with us today. Our theme for today is the power of feminist writing. Um, looking at how creating feminist gender sensitive language is, power through, uh, is possible through this writing. Everything in our lives often starts with words and language that we use, but does the language that we use reflect the experiences of everyone or only of those that are in power? Words can be a perfect tool that can be used for racism and oppression, but they're also a tool that can be used for change, freedom, decolonization, and inclusion. They have the power to stop categorizing humans, to stop reducing them to a certain label, and to build value for individuals and groups. But for that, it's really important that we use language consciously, and we use it in a manner that is just and equitable. What is this empowering effect of language and storytelling and how can it shape new narratives? In this panel, we have two brilliant panelists who will share a little bit more about that. Um, we have multiple viewpoints today. We have authors, um, someone who's been an author and a publisher. So I hope that today is an exciting conversation for each of us. I'm gonna take a second just um, to let more people in, I think, yes. Lovely. We have two panelists today. I'm very honored to introduce you to both of them. Um, first up, we have Minna Salami. Minna Salami is a Nigerian, Finnish, and Swedish feminist author and social critic at the New Institute. They're an independent writer, researcher, and lecturer. Her research focuses on Black feminist theory, contemporary African thought, and the politics of knowledge production. Minna is a widely published author, and their forthcoming book is Can Feminism Be African? due to be published in 2024. It explores the key themes of African feminism. Our second panelist is Urvashi Butalia. They co-founded Kali, India's first feminist publishing house in 1984. And today they run Zuban, an imprint of Kali. Zuban turns 20 this year, but actually it turns 39 as well. Urvashi is also an award-winning author. They're a yoga enthusiast who says that feminism is like breathing to them. It's what keeps them alive. I'm very excited to have this conversation with both of you. Welcome to the webinar. Before we get started, I'm seeing a bunch of chat messages and I will get to that. Um, I would encourage all participants to use the chat to share their name, pronouns, and if you're comfortable, also share where you're joining from and your favorite song. I'm just going to use chat to share this as well. Before we go ahead, we have some quick housekeeping information. Um, we request that you rename yourself with your name and pronouns as comfortable. A gentle reminder that interpretation is available in Spanish. We will also have some time throughout the webinar and at the end to take questions. So please keep your questions coming. Two other housekeeping rules. Um, we have a community wall where you can share thoughts, reflections, questions, and some participants have also used it to connect with each other. And if you have a minute, you can share what your favorite song is with us while we get started. Minna and Urvashi, I'm going to give it a minute so that more people can introduce themselves and we can get started then. I love that. I finally have one person who's given in and shared a song um, and it's by Miley Cyrus. Thank you. All right, we're going to get started, but please keep your introductions coming in. We'd love to get to know you as well. 
I'm going to start off with a question for both of you and please feel free to say hello to all of us while you answer it as well. It's a simple question. Um, what kind of feminist narratives do you think can empower those who face oppression? Minna, do you want to take it first? Sure, I can go first. Um, thank you, Vandita. Um, and thank you to the Henrich Ball um, Institute for inviting me to this really special event. Um, and it's so nice to see so many people here. Um, I'm, I'm really delighted to be able to speak about this topic uh, so close to Women's Day as well. You know, this, this feels extra special and important. Um, and since this is a panel uh, and a discussion about language, I'm going to uh, give myself permission to be <laughs> more sort of particular about words than I, I maybe would in, in, in another discussion. Um, and I thought I, what I want to do with uh, your question, what kind of feminist narratives can empower the oppressed is to kind of, uh, you know, to unpack the words a little bit. So uh, first of all, starting with the word narrative um, and a narrative is basically a, a, an account of something. Um, so it can be uh, a narrative can, can uh, take on very different formats. So it can be, of course, a, a text, but it can also be a, a story that is told orally. It can be a song, um, speaking of, of music and songs, um, a poem, a film, um, and so on. And um, and and uh, I think, you know, uh, since the question is about narratives, it is in some regard different to if we had said a text, which would be, you know, of course, the written word, a, a book, an essay, an article. Um, now, the, the second uh, word that I want to unpack a little bit is uh, empower or empowerment more broadly, which is uh, the, the wor a word that was coined by feminists, particularly uh, feminists from the global south. Um, and um, and I just thought it would be interesting to, to say a little bit about the, the kind of three parts of this word. So um, the prefix M uh, coming from Latin means to insert. Um, and the suffix ment uh, in Latin is, in, is signifies the mind, so mental. Um, and so when we say empowerment, um, we are in some sense, I mean, of course, this is not literal and this was not part of the coinage of the term, but it's interesting to think about that what we're saying is uh, to insert power into the mind. Uh, and of course, the mind is not only the brain, it is, you know, the, the spirit, the body, uh, the sort of holistic being. Um, and so what I would uh, say is just in terms of that first part of the question, uh, the kinds of narratives that can empower um, are narratives that can, in some sense, uh, you know, shift or alter something in, in the mind and, and, and make it feel more powerful. Um, now, the last word in this question, what kind of narratives can empower the oppressed, I think is also really uh, interesting in this context because um, in some sense, although it makes, might seem like it, empowerment and oppression are not necessarily opposites. Um, so I would say that uh, uh, the opposite of oppression in this context where I am allowing myself to be this particular is um, something more like to politicize. Um, and, you know, because we can be politicized outwardly. So, uh, you know, which is a, a very important feature of feminism where we uh, you know, we we work toward changing structures and policies and so on and so forth. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we are empowered in the sense that I've been describing. Um, so uh, maybe the word that I would have used there or that I think is useful is to think like what kind of narratives can empower the disempowered? Um, because empowerment is about not just politicization, it includes that but it also includes uh, a kind of conscientization, uh, awakening, uh, subjecthood, self-realization, all these kinds of terminologies. Um, so now that I've you know, clarified those things, my, my response would be that the kind of narratives that can empower the disempowered in that sense um, are narratives that affect us holistically, that affect us uh, you know, uh, uh, psychologically, politically, spiritually, emotionally, 
um, and, and that have that full range of, of powerfulness. Thank you for that, Minna. Um, I will come to some of the words you shared in a bit as well. Um, Urvashi, please come in. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Vandita. Thank you, HBS, for having us here. And I'm delighted to be on a panel with Minna that mentioned to you I've been reading her up and um, really enjoying everything. And Minna, thank you so much for unpacking that word. <clears throat> so I want to start with that because it's quite interesting that what how words mean different things in different places and in india for example empowerment is not a concept or a word that was brought in by feminists by and large it is something that's imposed on us by the state and therefore it is a much disliked word but now when you took it apart into the three the prefix the suffix and the body of the word i began to rethink it so i'm just just wanted to flag that and say I'm really grateful to you for doing uh, saying that and also just that how different words have different meanings relating to context, which is interesting in a discussion that focuses on language. Um, what kind of feminist narrative can empower the oppressed? So um, given all my reservations about the word empower, I'm taking it to mean that you're asking what kind of feminist narrative can be, I suppose, well, empowering. <laughs> Let me just, um, and I, you know, what I think is the feminist of any narrative by virtue of being feminist is by definition empowering or carries power with it and can be a really important thing for people who are marginalized, oppressed, um, who find themselves on the peripheries of society, whose voices have been silenced. And uh, let me give you a couple of examples about how I think this can work. So a narrative can carry possibly a straightforward political message. It can be something calling people to action. It can be something bringing people together to fight particular battles. But a narrative can also be a story of living through oppression uh, or of um, just, you know, a woman um, walking out of her house uh, for the first time in college for the first time in her life it can be any, any or, and many things. And I think just by virtue of having those voices out there, which have traditionally not been given the space to be articulated, to be heard, and which are now entering a space that has been dominated by and large by men. I think that act in itself is empowering and indeed extremely subversive. So I would say that any narrative, if it's feminist, would be the answer to your question. Thank you so much. Yeah, I was just going to say, please feel free to come in. Go ahead, Minna. Um, to start with, I also just wanted to say uh, how how much of a pleasure it is to share this panel with you, Urvashi, um, and I'm a big admirer of, of the amazing work that you've done for the feminist movement. Um, and but I, I just wanted to I'm really curious about the word empowerment being introduced uh, in India by the state. And I wondered if you could if you know a bit more about that, it would be great to hear how that happened? Like, like was it a co-opting of the word from other parts of the world or is there an equivalent word in, I don't know, in a, in a local language or something like that? So I think there, I mean, in different languages, because India has so many languages and I can, I see that there are a number of Indians in the, uh, among the participants, because I've been looking curiously at the chats. Um, and, uh, in our many languages, there are some words that approximate to that, um, but in other languages, there aren't. Even the word feminism, for example, is a much contested concept in this country. Uh, the government at some level, the state, not the government, brought in the notion of empowerment, I think late 80s, early 90s on when they tried to put in place some fairly large scale programs for women's education, for women's political power, health related programs, et cetera. 
So that's how the word came to acquire connotations of uh, being linked to the state. And what you described about what it meant was inserting or putting power into the mind. So the whole idea that someone else can insert, someone else can give you power is what was rejected by women's groups and feminist groups here because they, uh, the, our claim, their claim has been that power is ours to take. Agency is ours to use, to utilize, to act upon. Nobody can give it to us. It's not a thing you hand out. It is something that we will fight for. So in a sense, that's also the rejection because women wanted to claim agency and not have it trust, not have empowerment thrust upon them. Okay, yes, um, we have had a very similar struggle in the African continent um, where, uh, to, to my understanding, the word empowerment was first used in the 70s by feminist groups. Um, and then in the 80s, which would correspond with what happened in India as well, uh, organizations, you know, international bodies like the UN, the WHO, WTO, etc., started to use this language. Um, and so it became uh, you know, co-opted and, and de-radicalized in a sense. And in Africa, you know, there's a whole sort of uh, gender empowerment movement um, now, which, you know, I don't want to be too critical of because it's better than people not engaging with gender at all, but it's certainly not a feminist movement per se. So it's, you know, it's, it, I, I think I, I understand your point that empowerment, uh, yeah, like certain groups that are affiliated with the patriarchal state claim it and then uh, portray themselves as giving women this, this quality. Yeah. Hi, sorry. I think I froze there for a bit, uh, but I was able to catch what you were saying. No, thank you for those reflections. And I know like you started off by saying, Minna, that, you know, you wouldn't think of language as much if that wasn't the theme of the panel. And that really made me think about what empowerment or even the word feminist or narratives can mean for so many of us in different contexts. I think for the longest time, even the word narrative for me held a negative meaning because narrative for me was something that was constructed. Um, it was not something that was true, uh, perhaps because of the generation I grew up in. Um, I grew up with social media and narratives was about curating an opinion or curating a story rather than just sharing your authentic voice. And I think a lot of this dissonance with what language means and then how do we sort of build around that? How do we have solidarity around that language is really interesting to me. Um, even what both of you shared in terms of the state co-opting certain language. And then the state using that as a way to sometimes even shed their responsibility um, to locate the problem in the individual rather than in the system, right? Um, so that's been a very interesting journey for me to see as well. Um, I want to ask the participants a question before I come back to you all. Uh, participants, if we could launch the Zoom poll. The question is, do you look into the politics of the authors that you read? Yes, no, or can't say. Uh, we have authors and publishers with us, um, so I think this will be an interesting answer for you all. We'll give it another 10 seconds. Lovely. Um, I think we can close the poll now. Yeah, we have had over 160 people vote and there's a bit of a mixed reaction. There's a majority that says yes, but there are some that say no and some that say can't say. Um, I'd love for you all to reflect on this when we look at other answers and questions as well through the panel. And I'll come to my second question, Mina, which is for you, which is why, yeah, why, if at all, does feminist writing give hope for a fragmented world? Um, I'd love if you could even share what it has meant for you um, in your career as an author. So, uh, yeah, uh, again, I, I um, 
I, I think uh, the, the, there's an implication in the question, which is that a, a fragmented world is undesirable, um, which I agree with. Um, and I think many, many feminists would. Um, and so, uh, but at the same time, I, I think that there are maybe, um, you know, some, there's some sense in which, uh, you know, as feminists, we, we are a fragmented group. We are, uh, you know, we are, we do want to focus on specific issues. And, and so maybe, uh, you know, I've, I've written a lot about um, Afropolitanism, which derives from a kind of cosmopolitan worldview. Um, and so, to some extent, I think uh, what the world maybe needs is uh, the, the kind of mentality where we can be different, which is slightly different to being fragmented, but uh, but nevertheless, uh, you know, respectful and mindful of each other. Um, but to the extent that a fragmented world, as as you mean it, Vandita, I believe, um, is is undesirable. Um, I do think that you know, feminism is. Uh, the ideological and political movement that, uh, you know, brings the most hope um, toward uh, creating the opposite of a fragmented world, which is a kind of a, a world, uh, I don't know if unified is too strong a word, like we're not all going to be holding hands and uh, singing Kumbaya in agreement. Um, but um, uh, just by, uh, you know, the whole, the, the whole sort of core argument in feminism is uh, is an anti-domination argument um, and and uh, fragmentation is typically caused by hierarchies um, that have been created by what I call the Euro patriarchal system um, which is a dualist system and creates hierarchies and classifications of people which in return ends up uh, fragmenting us and uh, by nature of being, uh, an ideology that resists domination at its core, uh, feminism, uh, you know, is sort of uh, opposing fragmentation and 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 is is more kaleidoscopic in its nature in that it you know it, it kind of uh, zooms in and out of of uh, of narratives. Um, and in my own work, um, you know, I, I specialize in in Black and African feminist um, theories and knowledge production specifically. And you know the the kind of the biggest contribution of of black feminism um, is what we now call intersectionality, uh, you know, which is a kind of core idea of black feminism even before it was called um, intersectionality. And intersectionality in itself is, you know, it's a, you could say it's a defragmenting um, ideology because it's it's it helps it gives a snapshot of what it is like uh, to be a whole, even despite experiencing multiple systemic oppressions. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it, positioning myself and my work, uh, both in the feminist movement broadly and specifically in Black and African feminisms is a sort of steady reminder uh, that the work I'm doing is about ending fragmentation in a sense. I love that, Mina. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and when you spoke, um, I also noticed that there was a lot of reflection in chat, which was similar um, to what you started with saying that fragmentation really depends on the context. And when we're speaking of fragmentation here, we are speaking of difference and not necessarily the breaking up, um, you know, uh, based on identity. And I love that you brought an in intersectionality. In the several of our other panels, we have discussed what intersectionality means and how increasingly we're not just thinking about what it means in terms of identity, but also what intersectionality does in practice. And I find that feminist narratives could be a really powerful tool, uh, feminist writing and feminist narratives, to move from what intersectionality is to what it does. And you capture that beautifully, thank you. Do you want to add something? I felt like you wanted to. Um, I was looking for the reaction button, which I can't find for some reason because <laughs> I wanted to put a heart. Um, no, I just, I love what you said. I, I completely agree. No, thank you. Um, it's it's at the bottom of your screen. I, for the I have just found it and I'm going to heart it, even though it's late. <laughs> uh, one right back. Um, I'm going to ask a question to our participants, Urvashi, before I come to you. Um, the question for our participants is, have you ever engaged with feminist writing? that has made you feel empowered or hopeful?
I have to say, I love the speed at which all the participants are answering. Um, we'll give it another 10 seconds. I think we can close the poll now. Lovely. That's 88% participants saying yes. And that's quite beautiful um, to think of in terms of the impact feminist narratives and feminist writing has had. Um, thank you for sharing, everybody. Um, in line of that, Urvashi, my question to you then is, to what extent do you think our language is limited? And especially I ask you this in the role of feminist publishing, you know, what have been some highlights and challenges for you? And despite all of it, how does it continue to give that sort of hope and empowerment to people? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I mean, as usual, uh, Mina, uh, the way she articulated your, the responses to your question on fragmentation was also really fascinating. And before I move to responding to this question about how limiting uh, about language, I just want to say again, you know how differently things work in different places. Uh, within the Indian women's movement, and I see that a couple of people had uh, written in chat, one of the things that we've been very clear about is we've been hugely accused of fragmentation because our country is a country of such deep inequalities and hierarchies that very often women's activism is labeled, oh, it's only urban, or oh, it's only elite, it's not rural, it's not poor, et cetera, et cetera. And the intersectionality, which is actually at its heart, is generally denied by its critics. For those of us who are activists in the women's movement, the accusations that the women's movement or our movements, if you think of them in the plural, are fragmented is an accusation that we counter by saying, no, we are not fragmented, we are just diverse. And that the important thing to us is not to have a unified um, view, because one of the essential things about our feminisms is that we recognize difference. What is really important is that we maintain connections, we make connections, and we treasure those connections, some of which are very deep friendships, some of which are political connections, some of which are political sharing, and so on. So in a sense, um, the whole notion of fragmentation is one that means very different things to us here. Uh, now, Vandita, to answer your question about language, I think language in the matter of publishing and writing is both limit and opportunity. For us as feminist publishers, when we started 40 years ago, we published in English, we could only publish in English, being the first generation after colonialism, our education was in English. That's the only writing speaking language we had. I read Hindi and Punjabi, I write in Hindi, but I don't know how to publish in, in, in Hindi. My training was in English publishing. So I brought that training into feminism and they, not a day passed for years and years and years when I did not feel in some way that I was betraying the feminist movement that had basically made me what I am or turned me towards what I'm doing by functioning in a language that was the master's language, the colonial language a language that had been imposed on us. It's taken me many, many years to realize that writing travels, and it travels not only through language, but it travels in many other ways. It travels through theater, it travels through now podcasts, it traveled earlier through radio, cinema, so on and so forth. And also that if one looks at language as opportunity, then you can think of many imaginative ways in which to work in a, a context which is like ours with multiple languages. So, you know, um, I see that there is somebody here from an organization that we have worked closely with called Makam. Uh, and Makam works with workers of all kinds. And we uh, have worked with them and other organizations to do research, but it's not the top-down research where an English-speaking scholar from Delhi or someplace will go in and research the field, but it's the kind of research that feminism thinks, as, thinks of as 
uh, the research, the researched talking about themselves, the gap, you know, the between the researcher and the research to collapse that gap. I'm not saying it very elegantly, but you understand what I mean. And it's there that the, the language question comes up in very, very interesting ways. It also comes up for us all the time in publishing because we translate a lot and we translate into Indian languages a lot. So when I'm translating, I mean, when I'm publishing the work of a Dalit writer that I recently did from Bengal, and she writes in a dialect, I need to position myself in such a way that my upper caste, upper class placement does not put her language. And yet I need to make her language accessible to the world so that her voice is not lost. So, you know, in, in that sense, it's uh, that's what I mean by um, limit and opportunity, because it limits you in some ways, but you have to work with it creatively as a publisher to cross those limits. And then there's a whole world out there. Uh, maybe that sounds like a cliche, but that's really how I feel anyway. Not at all, not a cliche. Um, I think the bit you said on limit and opportunity is really going to stay with me. And also, how do we not allow this to become a limit for future opportunities or future change to be built off of what is happening right now? Um, so I think that's something that's really powerful. Also, I was very intrigued by what you shared around um, how writing travels. Because even when Minna shared about intersectionality, it is a theory that has traveled and gained its own meaning in different contexts. And as does writing from the Indian context, right? Um, I think there's this Edward Said's theory on like a traveling theory. And I see that resonate in how feminist writing and language is absorbed and owned by communities. Um, I, I think I always share this example. My mother doesn't speak English very well, but, um, and maybe if I asked her if she's a feminist, she would say she's not. But over like a decade of really working with her, if I asked her questions about her beliefs, they would resonate with my beliefs. And where there would be differences, there would be space for dialogue. And I think that's a bit of the limit and opportunity for me, um, where language has played a crucial role for me to bridge some of my learning to what is most personal to me but also allow for there to be that space and that limitation of some things never reaching a certain point. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that and for giving me the space to share as well. Mina, do you want to come in on any of this? But Because I have other questions then. Sure. Um, I'm just thinking, I don't know if I'll be able to, to articulate this very well, but um, the, all of the, the discussions that are happening here between us and also uh, reading in, in the chat, is making re me reflect um, firstly on, I don't know if all of you are familiar with this uh, advertisement that, you know, I don't know if it's uh, Maybelline or L'Oreal or something that says, you know, every second a woman is buying so-and-so mascara. Um, <laughs> it's it, it used to be really popular in the 90s or so. Um, I tend to think about my motivation with feminism, uh, co-opting that ad. Um, so basically, I want, you know, every second a woman to be going, I'm a feminist, and they're kind of light bulbs <laughs> switching on. Um, and the reason I start with that is because I think that there is a, uh, a real difficulty for us um, at this moment in time, and almost a kind of impasse to an extent, because our language has been so co-opted, uh, whether it is by the state uh, you know, by by uh, international organizations, and also today very much so by populists, which of course, uh, you know, work together with the state in, in new ways that, uh, you know, I think India is a, is a good example of that, um, without being an expert on what is happening in India, but from what I can see. Um, and so, because I'm noticing that, uh, you know, there's a uh, because words like empowerment are being misused in a kind of populistic way, um, and not least the word feminism itself, you know, there's somebody in the in the comments saying that we need to redefine feminism because, um, you know, in, in their culture, the word is not accepted. Um, and I just want to, I guess, uh, say, you know, in in this mission to actually create more feminism that I think, you know, we should not let go of. Um, we have to be 
very mindful and and maybe even bolder than ever in terms of holding on to our language, to the words that have been defined by feminists all across the world um, and, and not allowing them to be soiled and uh, you know, corrupted by populism, which uh, is proliferating in such dangerous ways uh, in the world today. Yeah. May I add something to what Mina is saying? I think just uh, in addition to the point you make, Mina, I think it's also very important that as those of us who are comfortable in our skin defining ourselves as feminists, uh, that we do not impose this need on others. To me, for example, a label is empowering and enabling if you want it to be. And therefore I would claim feminism as my label because it's what I live and breathe and feel comfortable in and what I feel defines me. But if my friends or my colleagues or my students do not want to call themselves that, that's fine. How does it make a difference? You know, what you call yourself in the end, it's just, so I agree absolutely what you're saying that we mustn't let go of the words. And the other day I heard people talking about this new thing that I think um, uh, comes from Europe called feminist foreign policy. And first I kind of did a U-turn thinking, what is this? And then I started thinking about it and I thought, okay, even to get the word feminist into that foreign policy vocabulary, which is so dominated by a completely different language is a victory. So maybe that, you know, we need to, just keep those sorts of things in mind. Yeah, it's really so tricky because I, I couldn't agree more that, you know, I would never impose feminism on anyone. And I've, I've uh, written and spoken a lot about um, how actually, you know, uh, sort of living a feminist life is far more important than labeling it a feminist life or writing about a feminist life or whatnot. And yet at the same time, uh, something in me resists uh you know sort of fully saying that i don't want to it's not imposed but i do in some sense want to advocate for feminism and not because of the label but because uh you know it it really is the the movement against patriarchy that has its uh, the strongest international and temporal roots um and and i find that women who uh, come to feminism uh, typically feel much less alone in the world. Um, but of course, it has to be a, a coming to feminism with a sense of, of agency. And, and for those of us who, who have gone through that process, I, I very much agree, Urvashi, that, uh, you know, we need to approach that with, with love and, and, and care. Thank you, Botikino. I find that really powerful. In fact, um, one of the webinars, one of the panelists shared that Feminism is something you need to enter into as a free person uh, with agency. And perhaps your journey through feminism will be one where you will reject feminism. Maybe the label, maybe the philosophy, but that is the freedom and the space for difference that feminism provides. And I've been seeing a lot of interesting comments in chat as well that reflect that, right? For a lot of us, feminism, the word itself is an imposition of a language and narrative that doesn't feel like our own. Um, it is a reshaping or wording of something that we have already known perhaps for centuries. So it definitely has a lot of different contexts and meanings, um, but it's also been very powerful for some. I know a lot of people in chat are also sharing how in their communities, using the word feminist can be a way for people to like, say, I don't want to engage with this, but it's also sometimes a signaling of, this is where you can find safety and community. So I think it comes with both like the, I don't want to say the goods and bads, you know, the, the easy parts and the difficult parts. Yeah. Right. Also interesting. Um, sorry. No, go ahead. Vandita, also interesting. Uh, again, how different words and this goes back to language. So for those of us in the global South, feminism carries the baggage of having come from the global North and uh, often the re rejection and reaction is because of that. And yet uh, the idea of intersectionality also comes from the global North, but it comes from a black woman. And it speaks to us so deeply because in her articulation of it, we recognize 
our realities and we recognize the battles that we have been fighting. So suddenly someone has given a name to something that, that you have lived through, but you haven't known what name to give it. Uh, and perhaps feminism doesn't speak in the same way um, because it has a slightly different history, but just interesting to see how, how concepts and words travel. No, definitely. Um, in fact, I think Nivedita Menon um, writes about what the term intersectionality means in the global South context and how perhaps the use of that language in India or in South Asia is an imposition perhaps of colonialism still because intersectionality is an understanding that has already existed within people in this subcontinent. Um, so that's something that Nivedita Menon writes about. And I think Jennifer Nash, who is a black feminist as well, they write about the need to think beyond intersectionality now and to recognize black feminists for more than that and to not make them like a tokenistic representative of intersectionality. So I love that how um, sometimes some things become a movement um, but what they might end up hiding or what they may end up um, blurring out a little bit to become that movement. Yeah, um, I'm going to ask the participants my last question for them for today, which is, has the lack of the right vocabulary ever limited your ability to express your experiences? Also, um, I just, while you all answer that question, I want to share that you can also DM me questions. Some of you are messaging them to me. That's perfectly fine. Or you can ask them in chat. We will get to them in a little bit. Thank you. I think we can close the poll in 10 seconds. Ah, okay. So I hear um, about 77% people saying yes and the rest saying no or can't say. Um, I find that really interesting and I'll also get to the panelists to reflect on it because we're speaking about language and often language becomes a tool of how we communicate and express our rights, our desires, our emotions. And that can be quite challenging. So my question to both of you now would be, how can we regain the power of language? Perhaps this time, Urvashi, I'll come to you first and then to Minna. Well, uh, many things, but I'll try to keep it short. I think, of course, um, by using it more and more, but that's not something that we have, women particularly have the freedom to do that easily. Uh, in response to the question that you posed, which, to which 75% people said yes, um, you know, again, from our context, in the Indian context, um, in some research work I did on the 1947 partition of India, I tried to speak to women who had lived through sexual violence. And in many um, things that I've done since then, I've tried to pursue this thing to find out. But I've come to the realization that uh, in a country where you can hardly speak about sex, one thing, how can you articulate sexual violence? And two, if women wanted to, and I don't think this is a question only for the South, this is a question everywhere, where is the vocabulary to articulate the deep sense of hurt, the violation, the destruction of your bodily integrity, so many things. Where is the vocabulary to speak of this? And perhaps that explains the deep silence that we see in the world around um, the issue of violence against women. So if we turn your question around, one of course is to claim language, fight for it. And many young people today are doing precisely that. Uh, in changing, uh, particularly questioning the gendered nature of language and uh, demanding that language accommodate spectrums of identity that they inhabit and so on, which is what we did when we came into our feminisms to demand that language not be sexist. So in a sense, those are all steps in trying to reclaim um, language. But I think it's also important um, for us, and I don't only mean women, but for us who want to understand this, uh, the 
the silences that a lack of vocabulary imposes to actually learn to listen to silence, to learn to listen to what women cannot say, what they will not say, what they want to say, but they have to keep hidden. And I will quickly, quickly tell you a little story that I dearly love that comes from Kerala. It's written by a writer called Chandrika. And it's a story of, it's called the story of a poem. And it is the story of a woman, her husband, her son. The, in the morning, the husband and son go off, the husband to work and the son is taken to school. In her head, while she's doing everything for them, a poem lurks. And every time she finds five minutes, she comes and writes the next line of that poem on a piece of paper that she's kept on her dining table. And it becomes evening and she rushes in for a shower and the closing lines of the poem come to her in her shower. She rushes out naked, writes them down, looks out of the window, sees the husband and son coming back. And then she tears up the poem and throws it away. And she says to the reader, now reader, if you want to know the poem, you'll have to get the scraps of paper and put them together. That's what you need to do. Get the scraps of paper and put them together and listen. Thank you, Rashi. Just wanted to give everyone a second to sit with that. Minna, over to you. Thank you. That was so beautiful. Um, I, I don't even know where to really follow up on that. But uh, yeah, I think that very much feels like this act of, of uh, yeah, using words to reclaim power in a sense. Um, and, and it took me back to what you said earlier, Ovashi, about, you know, the kind of classic uh, feminist statement that power is, is never given, it is taken. Um, and I think the same applies to the power of, of language. Um, you know, it's not something that will ever be given to us. It is something that we will need to take. Um, and we've never had that opportunity to the fullest extent, you know, so there isn't some, it isn't actually something that we are uh, necessarily reclaiming or regaining. It is something that we are inventing and creating um, uh, as feminists. And, and this takes me back uh, somewhat to the, the, the points raised about um, intersectionality versus feminism earlier, because um, I do think, I mean, this is perhaps me speaking about my lived, coming from my lived experience to, to create a theory, um, but I, I have, uh, you know, I so frequently encounter since the kind of popularization of, of intersectionality, which I think is fantastic, even though I do agree with uh, Jennifer Nash, who Vandita mentioned earlier that, you know, there are now, um, because intersectionality has been co-opted, uh, we now need to become, uh, we need to take it in new directions. Um, and that fits into part of what I want to say, because, for example, um, you know, when I'm in uh, Nigeria or in um, it, let's say in sort of global south uh, dynamics, um, I find that, uh, you know, anti-feminists particularly are very happy for me to speak about intersectionality in the same way that they once were happy for me to speak about womanism. And, and I therefore feel that it is important for me to speak about feminism because I'm curious about that thing that is bothersome about the word. Um, and I don't think that it is, I mean, I, I think that's where, uh, you know, we need to be able to, to be sensitive enough to glean whether the rejection of that word is coming from a place of say, this is not my language, this is not my culture, uh, you know, this is not my indigeneity, um, which happens sometimes. But for the most part, I think I, my curiosity about that rejection leads me to think that it is good old sexism, uh, you know, that, that doesn't want women to talk about feminism and we can we can talk about intersectionality because then we can also focus on, on race and ignore uh, gender and sex oppression. And, and similarly in the West, you know, we can talk about gender, uh, uh, but in, ignore race, you know, intersectionality is starting to be used in, in those kinds of ways. Um, but in any case, yeah, I just think that we, uh, like even this word intersectionality is, uh, you know, it, 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 as has been pointed out, you know, similar expressions existed before it, but it is so useful because it gave language to something that already existed. And there are so many more 
uh, you know, situations, uh, patterns, uh, structures, social relations, et cetera, et cetera, that exist and that we haven't yet given language to. I mean, just think, for example, the word, uh, you know, cis woman, which, um, you know, is, is so helpful for us now, but it's such a new, to, I mean, it's existed in academia for a while, but we are only just starting to, to see what it can do for us in terms of understanding uh, different, different gender positions and roles, right? So um, I absolutely think that we, we just are at the tip of the iceberg of this journey of, you know, inventing new language and reclaiming language. Thank you, Mina, and thank you, Urvashi. Um, Mina, what you've shared, and also thank you for trusting us with your personal experience there. Um, I think that's quite powerful in understanding how narratives can be co-opted and the need for us to discern um, where we need to present in what way. And perhaps that's a use of language as well and a use of like narrative as well to drive our mission and collective vision forward. I really resonated with that because I am now often called to speak on things which sometimes I feel are more palatable to the people I'm speaking with. Rather, and there's a question in chat as well, and I'll come to that with y'all is sometimes there's a discomfort with things that are political. And there is an ease with things that can be um that can be made more theoretical or academic without understanding that they come from a root of politics and that they are fundamentally about political radical change. Yeah, so thank you for that. And Urvashi, um, if you have any written um, excerpt of that story, I think it's something that's really going to stay with us for a while. Um, I also really enjoyed that part of, at least what it made me think of is who has the luxury of writing their narrative? Because I kept thinking of, okay, she takes five minutes to go write a few more lines. Um, and she always has to, like. it feels like she's stealing time from her own life. And that's such a difficult thing for so many of us to have the time to think of what our story is. Yeah. So thank you both of you. That was really powerful. I'm going to ask you my last question because I have like 20 questions from the participants. Um, so I'm going to hand over to their question soon. Um, my last question is, how do you avoid othering in our language and narratives? So I'm going to start with Minna and then Urvashi. Oh, that's a really big question, um, a very important one. Um, I think the way to avoid othering is, um, or I'm not even sure if you if you mean to avoid uh, that we other or to, to avoid the impact of being othered or maybe both. I think um, both would be nice to you. Both, both, yeah, they kind of interweave with each other. Um, I think the, you know, understanding the roots of the othering, so understanding the history of uh, becoming other in some sense can be a really healing and powerful thing to do. Um, so again, uh, you know, speaking from my uh, background as an African, uh, you know, the, 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 if I um, as an African, which, you know, in essence is the same thing as saying almost as an other, uh, in a global context. And, uh, you know, if I trace back the history of African identity um, from its very beginning when uh, people from the continent we now know as Africa start being labeled African, uh, you know, this was a, a term invented by European colonizers. And from the very moment of conception of this terminology, um, they also othered Africans at the same time. So in all of the writing that was produced about Africans, we were other. Um, and, and so what I mean then by tracing uh, back and understanding that history, not only like understanding colonization and so on, because of course, uh, you know, we, we do know that, but that very moment of which narratives, you know, when the seed of the other was planted into the narrative um, and going back there and trying to sort of tease out what it would mean to not have gone down that path. It's almost like that uh, famous Robert Frost poem, poem of, you know, two roads emerged in the woods. And uh, he says something like, I chose one of them and that has made all the difference. Um, and, and I'm speaking now just, you know, in a sort of individual and maybe in a, in a sort of collective uh, theory and praxis to, to kind of go back to the origin seed of the othering and choose the other path. 
Um, and of course, we can't erase history and we can't erase the very real material um, consequences that still shape our lives today. But we can hold the, the fact that we were made other by a, a, a racist narrative in the context of Africa anyway. Um, so I think really, you know, yeah, um, understanding that there's a, a kind of way out. And that also similarly shapes the kind of uh, writing or storytelling or shaping of narratives that we may create. Uh, for instance, again, to as you've said, Vandita, we're going to keep referencing back to that poem that um, or story that Urvashi shared, because I think that's again, an, that's an example of sort of refusing to be other. It's like going, creating something new, but on one's own terms, but also understanding the the surrounding uh, patterns that that shape your life. Um, so in essence, it's a there's no straightforward answer to to the question, but I think all of these things factor in. No, while you didn't give a straightforward answer, I think it added a lot of value. And honestly, for me, I feel like there's a lot to think about, um, especially the part about who shapes the other, um, because I felt that very strongly in what you were sharing, that who makes me the other? And how does that power play out? That was really powerful. Thank you. Urvashi, over to you. Thanks, Vandita. So uh, before I answer your question, and as Mina said, it is a really big and difficult question. Uh, I do want to echo what someone said in the chat, which is, Vandita, you are a formidable moderator because you're so good about the questions you ask and about the comments you make and you know, you're just doing all that, all of that effortlessly and we're learning so much. I'm really delighted and I'm going to steal you every now and again to moderate things that we do. So I'm telling you this right here. Um, okay, to your question, you know, um, I think othering isn't really only a question of language. In fact, language is, language is a powerful tool of othering, but the othering happens from us as human beings and where we are located and how we look at our experience and how we interact with other people. And again, someone in the chat said, can we talk about um, privilege? Now, true, and that I think we have to talk about privilege. And as a publisher and as a writer, I know very well, all of us know, language is a tool of the privilege. Language has been created by the privilege. Language, through its absences, uh, renders invisible. And I, these are cliches, but I'm just trying to sort of pack it in, in in one sentence. It renders invisible so many people, so many experiences, uh, that in order to get back into that, even to be seen, they have to claim. We have to claim language, right? So in the way that, for example, a language uses words that are supposedly gender neutral and wipes out our, in the old days as early feminists, we would feel wiped out in those, you know, in, in Hindi, in my language, in the Punjabi, they would say, class mein bhot sare ladke hain. there are many boys in the class, but they mean boys and girls, you know? So where are we? We're not there in the language at all. And therefore we are completely othered and we grow up with this experience of being othered. But at the same time, when I step out of my house to buy vegetables as somebody who has the luxury to live in a relatively upper class place, and I am buying vegetables from the vegetable seller, um, but looking at my time and getting angry with him for having come five minutes late, what am I doing other than othering? So in a sense, I think it's something that we have to recognize. And I'll go back to what I said earlier, that the important thing for us, uh, and I strongly believe this, is to make connections. You know, and once you start to make those connections, then people become what they are, which is just people. They are not, um, you know, somebody who's poorer than you. They're not somebody who's, I don't know. They, they don't, those identities which allow you to other them then, um, become secondary to the human equation. I, I don't know if that, um, that makes sense, but I do feel that. I, I mean, basically what I'm saying, it's not only a question of language. It is a question of how you deal with people. 
No, definitely. Um, both of you have constantly been making a lot of sense. So thank you for that. Um, but Urvashi, from what you've shared, I think um, that has been at the core of like how I think of my identity as well sometimes and how it's been fluid in what I've learned and then what I keep doing to others. And I think the othering becomes so ingrained in me that that becomes a way of life for me because the only way I know how to live is to have another. I would not know how to exist without that. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I have a lot of questions from participants for y'all now. Um, some of them have been DM'd to me. In cases where you have shared uh, the question in the open chat, I will share your name. But if you have messaged it to me, I will not share your name. But feel free to share in chat that, oh, I asked that question. And that's okay. Great. So there's the question by Clarice, which is using feminist language and narrative in some places has another delicate aspect when you can come into risk because of your words. Um, that's something I'm wondering right now and have friends who were silenced with violent threats. When this comes from the state, you really have to think about the language used. And I believe it's possible to go around this in some cases. Um, they'd love to hear your thoughts on it. So whoever wants to go first. Minam. Um, <laughs> yes, I think it is so important to, uh, you know, never put ourselves at risk. Um, we are already too few um, who are doing this work and we want to make sure that we all stay healthy and alive to the extent we can um, and, and safe. Um, and I think going just to, to piggyback uh, back to what Urvashi said about uh, making connections um, that can be really useful in this kind of situation is, you know, uh, connecting with, with feminist groups um, around the world. You know, there are so many women um, and people of all genders uh, that have faced persecution of various sorts. Um, and, you know, they, they certainly have a lot to say on how what to do with language in, in these kinds of circumstances. Urvashi, would you like to come in? Um, okay, yeah, I, um, I mean, Mina said it all, but basically I think um, it's a question of, yes, being uh, aware of your vulnerabilities and the choices that are available to you in a particular context. And, um, you know, and a strategy about how far um, you're willing to go, how much it matters at that particular moment to, to fight for, say, the use of a particular language, even if it can mean physical danger or violence or whatever to you. So I think uh, the important thing for us is to make a choice weighing up all of those things. And I don't think there's a formula. Certain choices are good in certain contexts. I have often found when I get caught in these arguments of why are you using feminist language and there is a lot of anger, etc. I've often found that having a discussion where you take it away from feminism, but look at the kinds of hierarchies that exist in language or uh, the ways in which certain languages, certain the use of certain words becomes insulting at some point and changes. So just to give you a very banal example, you know, uh, I would of, I often talk about during the world wars, how the Italians and Japanese were identified as Japs and such like, and how the Germans were called the Krauts and so on, uh, or the word Negro and black. And these things become it becomes possible to talk about hierarchy in language. It becomes possible to talk about hurt and insult in language. And sometimes that helps, but I'm not saying that it's a formula. It's just sometimes I use that strategy and it seems to at least create space for a discussion. No, thank you both of you. Um, there are a bunch of more questions. I'm just gonna throw them at you. Um, one I'm picking up is some conversation on chat. Um, is the idea that feminist language seems to be getting quite intellectual and often that can be alienating for those who may not have that access to education or, you know, that sort of privilege. So are we moving to a place where feminist language is so elite that it can only be accessed by the elite? Um, either of you. Um, 
Uh, I'd say yes, I think it is. Uh, we do run that danger, and which is why I think the insistence on feminist language needs to be strategically deployed and um, also thought about. Uh, but I think yes. I mean, I don't think in, in asking for language to be inclusive, we are doing that. But I think in uh, making it too academic and the concepts, we are alienating people. Yeah. Thanks, Urvashi Manna. Um, yeah, I do. I think that there is a risk of uh, too much of a sort of intellectualized, or maybe it's even uh, the fact that feminism in academia uh, has, you know, has spread so so rapidly. Um, but I think it's important to be aware of the the multi layeredness of feminism, um, because when we talk about feminism, there's still this sense that we're talking about you know, one movement. And, and in some regard, of course, it is that. Um, but there exists feminism in so many different realms of society, right? Um, so, of course, yes, there are feminist scholars who are, uh, you know, speaking in theoretical jargon. Um, but there's also, uh, you know, a whole field of feminist art. Um, feminist activism is still probably the largest segment of the feminist movement at large, and feminist activists are not uh, using over intellectual language. Um, you know, there are feminist musicians, feminist culture, like, you know, we, we have feminism, uh, and this kind of goes back a little bit to the conversation about fragmentation, because, and how I was saying that feminism, to me, is the most kind of defragmenting uh, ideology because precisely because you know there is uh, feminism sort of seeks to understand every little part of society um, and so if if you know of course those of us who are not scholars um, would feel alienated from from academic feminism in the same way we would feel alienated from academic uh, engineering or something right um, but but we should not forget I think we do a disservice to feminism if we forget that there are also a lot of uh, you know other other sectors uh, where feminism is simplified without being uh, sort of uh, compromised in its in its meaning thank you minna um i have like a few people who've asked this question so i'm going to paraphrase it which is um, since both of you come from different generations of being feminist authors publishers um just in the movement as well how has that shaped your politics or how has that shaped how you situate yourself? Of course, you only have to answer as much as you would like to. Minna, do you want to go first this time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can go. Um, yeah, that's such a good question. And, and it is a really um, tricky one also because it's a, it's a challenging question for me anyway. I feel that I, um, I probably was most influenced by uh, what is known as second wave feminism um and uh, you know because that was my parents generation those were books that i had access to when i was a child and when i first encountered feminism i was reading uh second wave feminists like uh angela davis um gloria steiner you know people like that um and then of course i, I belong to uh so-called gen x um and you know that era of feminism uh, again, was really different. It was more about the sort of sexual politics. Uh, you know, that was when words like empowerment and liberation, uh, you know, proliferated in culture. If you think of like Sex and the City and uh, a lot of like uh, R&B music, Destiny's Child, TLC, like these things deeply shaped me. And, and I still think that there's a lot of my feminism that is inspired by both this kind of 90s girl feminism and um, the second wave. Uh, and yet I would probably, uh, you know, if I had to choose uh, a kind of era of the feminist movement, I think uh, the one today, which is imperfect, um, but I, yeah, I, I think the kind of, I don't know if we have a, a you know, if maybe it's fourth wave feminism, uh, you know, feminism influenced by Gen Z and millennials, but it's, um, I do think that there's something really powerful um, about the feminist movement today. And, and that is to do with the fact that, you know, that we now have feminism in all of these separate realms that I was speaking about earlier. 
Um, and so I just think, you know, it's partly a generational thing. It's partly that the world is in uh, so much of a crisis, you know, with climate change and so on that, that you know, we're really taking feminism seriously. Um, so I guess my short answer is that I'm influenced by all feminism, <laughs> basically. Thank you, Mina. Urbishin? So as you can see from my gray hair, I belong to the generation of older feminists or old <laughs> feminists. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting to, because this generational question is a question that I think confronts all of us. So people, women of my generation who came into feminism in the 70s, and I'll speak from that personal experience just to respond to that question, we um, brought with us certain experiences, certain uh, forms of activism, et cetera. Um, and for us, it was very easy to move from the political understanding of feminism that we might have gained in universities and so on and so forth to activism on the streets. Because there was, in India at least, the entire country was erupting with protest movements, right? So um, to bring our feminism into action, if you like, to get a sense of meaning from being involved with protests on the street, it was not difficult. So we felt that we had learned from experience. Now things have changed so much now, street level activism in most of our countries has become a thing of the past. The internet has become a space to mobilize and talk and so much else has happened and the issues too have changed. So I, I see both a conflict and an opportunity to learn if we are able to actually allow ourselves to do that. And in order to be able to allow ourselves to do that, women of my generation have to have considerable humility and openness to listen to the kinds of feminisms that are finding articulation today, which may be very different from ours. And sadly, many of us don't. Many of us are, uh, because we have also acquired a certain power, you know, um, we have not reflected enough on how to deal with that power in a feminist way. And because the only patterns we seem to know are the patterns inherited from capitalist male neoliberal enterprise, we end up, repeat, we end up repeating those, you know? So for example, I am you know, very preoccupied now with thinking about what does it mean to create a feminist institution? How does feminist run through every vein and capillary of this institution? What does it mean? And how can we be fair to our workers? It's not only a matter of publishing feminist content, but how do you deal in a feminist way with your colleagues and so on? And I know that I often do not do it right because I carry that power with me and I think I'm a damn nice person, but actually, as my colleagues one day said to me, you have no idea of the history that you carry with you. So I think these confrontations and these discussions are the lifeblood of our feminisms today, where across generations we have to talk and we have to listen. And that, if we do that, I think we will nourish the many different strands of feminism. But often uh, women of my generation do not, and often younger women are very intolerant of our, um, whatever, failures or whatever, that doesn't make for a great conversation. Thank you, both of you. Um, we have a lot of questions. Unfortunately, we only have a few more minutes for questions. So I'm going to paraphrase a dominant sort of question that seems to exist. Um, one is that feminism may not be the language of my people, right? Like maybe that's not the language we use um, to talk about these similar issues. And then a related question is that there's been a recent trend of decolonizing feminism and it's being used um, by a lot of gender experts, but at the same time, people from the global South find it unacceptable because it seems like giving power or the voice to the feminist movements in the global South, but it's being given by the global North. Um, so I'm gonna ask you all to give me like maybe quick one minute reflections on what you think about this. Uh, because we will start closing after that. Shall I go first, Mina? Um, 
Yeah, okay, so I always find this and it worries me, you know, it's like there is a broad understanding or broad, I, I don't know, belief that feminism is a kind of race and that the goals that it has set itself are goals that have been uh, largely met by the North or the West or whatever it is you call it, the, the colonial powers or the ex-colonial powers, and that those of us in the global South have a lot of catching up to do. And I think this is oversimplistic. It is also imperialist in its assumptions. It is inegalitarian and it is insulting. Uh, you know, so I, I don't think that it's a good way to go. I mean, when I'm sometimes when I'm abroad, I get asked, oh, you live in India. It's a country that's so violent towards women. How do you actually do it? How do you run a feminist publishing house? Come on, I've been doing it for 40 years, you know, and it's like, okay, all countries have complexities. I don't want to get into that. So I think that we really need to say, look at feminism more like a mosaic across the world where the politics of our multiple feminisms grow out of their particular context. And it's not a gift or a privilege that somebody elsewhere who has had power over, over us um, historically or who's more economically more powerful can hand to us. That's a, you know, uh, sorry to sound terrible, it's a load of bullshit. So it really has to be something that we recognize as something that we own and it grows out of our context. And um, I think the worry about decolonizing feminism, yeah, of course it has to be decolonized, but I, um, I would just ignore the colonial part of it and I would just do my feminism in the way that I think is best. The West can take care of itself. Thanks, Urvishni. Minna, over to you. Yeah, my feelings are, <clears throat> sorry, very similar. I, I just feel exhausted by the way that, you know, we come up with words and radical theories around them. And then, you know, you get all these institutions and not only institutions, also individuals from the, you know, Western white people who, um, who take on these terms to describe what is a very different mission than the term originally implied, uh, which is typically a mission to sort of save, uh, you know, whether it's women or brown or black people and so on. Um, and it's, it's so, so tiring. I mean, it's, it's truly, it it's said a lot, but I, I find myself, uh, you know, at least once a day, I probably am like in some way struggling with how can I communicate this despite the way that the word has now been, you know, come to signify. Um, but in that vein, to, to end this question with something more positive, I managed to read one of the threads here uh, and somebody described, I'm paraphrasing because I just skimmed it, but um, working with a group in South Africa and the women couldn't say patriarchy, so or they didn't know that word, so they said Patrick, and now people are saying Patrick must fall. I love that. And, you know, I love I that too. <laughs> it's so great. And that's something that we've, we've always had to do right because of this very problem is to invent new words and I kind of wish that we didn't have to but maybe you know that's the answer that we we start calling the patriarchy Patrick until they clue onto that and co-opt it but you know it can just be Patrick <laughs> abolish Patrick <laughs> no yeah thank you so much um on that note um before we close for today I'm going to request that everyone who's here gives us another 10 minutes because it's been a really powerful series and we want to take 10 minutes to say a big thank you to each of you and share some closing reflections. Um, Minna and Urvashi, you all have been so great. Um, as always, I've learned not just about like theory and how to do things, but I think I've learned a little bit more on how can I live a feminist life and how that's perhaps something I have to prioritize over everything else especially the honesty and vulnerability with which both of you have shared and all our panelists have shared. I think that's been quite inspiring for me. And a big thank you to each of you that's been joining the webinars. I now see familiar names and faces, so that makes me really happy. And we've had you consistently show up for all the webinars. We really appreciate that. We've had some wonderful panelists and we hope to share some key insights in an open access format with each of you. But now, most importantly, um, a big thank you to the Heinrich Pohl team that thought of this, that brought us together. Um, Adna, Naida, Joanna, and everyone else. And I'm going to invite Joanna from the team to share their thoughts and reflections as we conclude the series. So please do stay back for the next 10 minutes. Joanna, over to you. Yes. 
Thank you, Vandita. Thank you very much. Uh, dear guests, dear participants of today's panel, uh, on behalf of the Global Unit of, for Feminism and Gender Democracy at the Heinrich Böll Foundation, the organizer of this uh, online discussion series on the power of feminist narratives from fragmentation to solidarity, I have the honor to make some closing remarks. We organized uh, this series because we saw the need to show the power of feminist activisms in the plural and based on it uh, on the power of multiple feminist narratives. In the time of strong anti-gender, anti-feminist and anti-LGBTIQ movements, we wanted to make feminist voices across the world even more heard. We wanted to focus less on problems and more on practicable solutions. We have asked our partners and their partners to join this experiment. We were very happy to get a positive response from 10 wonderful feminists from Asia, Africa, Middle East, Europe, North and South America. Two of them are today with us. Each of the discussions had a specific focus, such as activism for self-determination, for bodily integrity, feminist research, feminist teaching, and last but not least, feminist writing and publishing. Bringing in different perspectives from activists based in different parts of the world. With this, we wanted to overcome, overcome the dichotomy of the North and the South, of the West and the East, of modern and traditional. You, both of you, were talking about today too. This was not because we don't see differences between and within different contexts. In the contrary, we do see and practice context-related intersectional and anti-colonial analysis of gender power relations. However, in this series, we followed the idea of distinguished com commonality, a term and a method developed by our partner from Germany, Kain Collective, a group of artists and activists. Inspired by their work and methods, we wanted to create digital dialogue spaces in which mutual perception and appreciation was the basis for conversation. In contrast to the patriarchal way of speaking, where the focus is on wanting, wanting to be right, the five online conference, conferences were about creating spaces in which mutual trust, generous sharing of one's own experiences and knowledge are the basis for mutual affirmation and for engaging with the uncertain and the unknown. As our kind collective colleagues say, say, such an approach to exchange creates a de-hierarchized empowering space in which people affirm each other, ask each other questions, and in this way are more able to enter and grow from the differences between them. We are so grateful that our wonderful guests accepted our invitation, entered the space of mutual learning and shared their rich experiences with each other and with all of us. In the order of the discussions, we are thanking Lee Kellar from Sentido in Colombia, Julia Erd from Ilga World, the International Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Trans and Intersex Association coming herself from Germany, Dan Christian Gattas from Organization Intersex International coming from Germany, Jivi Kashif, lawyer and feminist activist from India, Shams Radwani Apti, academic teacher and activist from Tunisia, Evren Safchi, academic teacher and activist activists from Turkey and the USA, Agnieszka Graf, academic teacher and activist from Poland, and last but not least, 
Mina Salami and Ur Urvashi Putalia, our guests of today's panel. We are thankful for your openness in sharing your experiences as feminist activists and professionals, your own, for your own learnings, but also your own doubts and how it happened that you have sometimes changed your positions. All of you are role models to us. You show us that it's possible to think and act as a feminist in different political and geographical contexts and that the feminist fights for a just and equal world free of violence are important for all societies. Last but not least, the language you speak, the narratives you choose and the stories you tell are understandable and accessible for others because they are rooted in embodied experiences. But the discussion series on the power of feminist narratives would have not been possible if we had not had our wonderful moderator, Vandita Moradka, the founder and director of One Future Collective from India. Dear Vandita, we are so grateful that you agreed to facilitate these five discussions. Your own feminist activism, your own Indian base, but at the same time, international experiences within the feminist movement, your self-reflected attitude, your ability to listen, to connect the dots, to rephrase what might not be understandable, your deep affirmative relation to other people's experiences and your rich methodological instruments. I could list even more of your talents if I had more time. <laughs> All this was the foundation on which these online discussion series could be built on. Together with our guests, you walked the talk of feminist solidarity and of feminist power, which is based on responsibility, trust and dialogue. We as organizers have learned a lot listening to all of you and feel empowered to continue our own efforts for a better world based on feminist values. We are also thanking all hundreds of participants who joined us from all parts of the world that you decided to take part with us on this feminist learning journey. We hope you feel a bit empowered too. Please share your learnings with others so we can multiply our insights and make the feminist movements stronger. Finally, I want to thank all the people who made this online discussion series possible, as it was a feminist teamwork. Thank you to my colleagues, Jana Prozinga, Naida Kuczak-Wulic and Marima Šišić, who developed the concept of the discussion series with me. Thank you for Adna Kalajdzi-Szalichowicz, supported by Aida Fatic and Marima for her so fruitful public relation work. Thank you, Jaina Saraj Mekic and Asmira Salishbashic Kashabovic for your administrative support. Thanks to our technical supporters, David Rötler and Olivia Schneider, who backed up each discussion. Many thanks to the interpreters from English into Spanish, Silvia Lopez Sanchez, Elena Sanchez Orta and Tania Sanchez from Guerilla Media Collective for your commitment and sensitive interpretation. And thank you to thank you to the whole team of One Future Collective who assisted us and will write web articles highlighting the main insights of all five discussions. You will find the articles on our website www.bell.de in few weeks. Thank you very much for your attention. Let us stay in touch in, and in solidarity and have a powerful International Women's Day tomorrow. Thank you very much. Take care.